host, Scott Rubin. This is a Torah study show, The Word. We read from the Torah here and try to squeeze as much wisdom, profundity, humor from its verses. But do we really need to? What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Jesus says in Matthew, you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And this becomes known as the golden rule, the second greatest commandment in Christianity. Essentially, the same thing said by Hillel, but in a different way. So why do we have to study Torah? Can't we just tattoo this sentence, love thy neighbor as ourselves, as thyself, in, in our arms? Some of us project it on the garage door for the holidays, but it never quite takes. Two days later, you're yelling at the drive through lady because she forgot to put the ketchup packets in the bag with your fries. Apparently, deep learning, well, you need a setup. You know, for real understanding and meaning to take hold, you can't just throw out punchlines without the setups. There's got to be context. What Hillel and Jesus said, the golden rule of thy neighbor as thyself, is an aspiration, a goal for all of us. It's, it's a landing spot, perhaps. But for it to really penetrate, you have to learn the why, the how, of loving your neighbor as thyself. And even then, you need to be reminded with our special guest. He's an author, a playwright, a raconteur who thinks way ahead of the curve and yet refuses to be paid in Bitcoin. Hmm. We'll talk about that later. Welcome, Dylan Brody. Good evening. Uh, in the immortal words of the humorist and comedian Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> Very nice. <clears throat> She's been elected president of the Screen Actors Guild multiple times, despite the MyPillow guy contesting every election. Welcome, the former star of one of TV's most successful shows ever, Beverly Hills 90210, Gabrielle Cateris. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello, he's working out on stage for his upcoming one-hour comedy special. He still can't crack that last 10, especially without the Bowflex on stage. Welcome, comedian, podcaster, and my sidekick, Mr. Sandy Danto. Hey, Scott, don't tell my wife that I've been loving my neighbor as I love myself. Oh, How many times did I say it that way? <laughs> I, I only heard it that way. Oh, you only heard it that way. Okay. Uh, I heard it that way as well. For the record, for the record, I was all over that as well. I was thinking, I once had a restraining order for loving my neighbor as myself. I, yeah. <laughs> I, she's an actress, a thinker, and an individualist. She's always been one of a kind. Welcome. The words regular Jackie Venet. Hi. Okay, last week we left off with the story of Cain and Abel, and we were plowing through it. We made it to verse 22, basically, if you know, you remember the story. Cain gets a little jealous. He takes off, takes out Abel. Then Cain is sent wandering, and God puts a protection on him, and uh, so the word doesn't get out and try to kill him. Cain starts building city, uh, you know, and he has some offspring, and the offspring are... Uh, you know, they've got all sorts of talents, you know, flutes and, you know, they could cut iron. It's a very impressive offspring. So that's where we're at. Genesis chapter 4, verse 23. Now Lemech, Lemech being uh, one of the offspring of Cain, said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hearken to my voice, wives of Lemech, incline your ears to my words, for I have slain a man by wounding him, and a child by bruising him. And verse 24, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then for Lemeth it shall be seventy-sevenfold. Wow, okay, well, here we are. Man is just getting started, and he's already flying off the rails. And once again, murdering. For what motive? Who knows? At least Lemek's great-great-grandfather, Cain, murdered out of jealousy. 
But with this, it's 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 just murder, as if he, as if he just screwed up, you know. It's like it's like the mafia, and then God is like the Godfather. He's gone wrong, but his Sicilian blood, he's family. Boy, that sounded like a Jewish Sicilian, or just a bad actor. Maybe it is the family, really. Maybe it is. We protect one of our own. With Cain and L Lamech, Lamech, God is counting on this family, this bloodline, to produce eventually righteous people, I think. Allowing Cain or Lamech to be killed could end the line and maybe all potential, all possibility. Could it be that in this early stage of man, possibility and potential are more important to God than maybe an actual human life? There must be a future to man. The family must survive. Maybe allowing Cain or Lamech to die would jeopardize the rise of civilization. And we go to the guests. We go to the guests. Gabrielle, <laughs> why do you think God is protecting Lamech and Cain? What's going on here? In my in my being a parent, which I would say before being the SAG after president, being a parent, sometimes it's hard when my kids do something. And I always say to them, if you do something that puts you in jail, I'm not going to take get you out of jail, but I will always love you. So um, I don't. But the idea of forgiving the act, it's not my job to forgive the act, right? If you have, there's accountability. So I'm not, again, I'm not, I think it's interesting. I think the idea of preserving humanity because it's young is interesting, but I'm not sure that I understand it. So I am very much looking forward to other people's interpretation of it. <laughs> Dylan, um, what do you think? First of all, is God protecting man? Is God protecting something? Really what this is about is God not yet having written the rule book. And when he hands those tablets to Moses, it's the moment when man finally goes, okay, let's just figure out what the rules are. We can't keep playing this by ear on a case-by-case -case basis. That's what I would say this is about. This is about the learning curve of either the external God or the internal conscience. Sandy. God is Lemmick's bodyguard. God is Kevin Costner and Lemmick is Whitney Houston. And he's singing, and I, I will always love Hashem. I think that- uh, Very nice. By making pain, by making Lemmick live with with the, the consequences of their actions being to, to carry on in life, it is part learning curve for God, but it's also like the death penalty is a much easier way out for the person that's done wrong, living is a lot harder than death. Who knows what terrors God would have in store for a person that has murdered a nagging, nagging wives more than one, a yappy dog whose eye boogers won't ever go away. Every Jew in Lemmick's lineage is still suffering from irritable bowel syndrome and allergies. Maybe that's part of it. <laughs> Well, we. <laughs> Where is it written that you know that? Jackie. As scientists are discovering now that the more that we punish people with aggression, the more that it accelerates aggression in the person that you're punishing. Like with children, if we see a child doing something wrong and we punish them with aggression, it only accelerates the aggression in the child as they grow. So God knowing this says, if you do something bad, this is my perspective. I'm not going to punish you with aggression because that doesn't help. So he's saying, I know what you're doing is wrong, but I can't punish you because you need to figure it out. We all need to learn. But as he's going through his own learning curve, he sees that, wow, these humans are really not understanding this. So he has to then put in the law that you can't kill. All right. Well, it sounds good. Sounds good. Did, Sandy, did you have a last thought on that? Um, you know, like you said, we haven't gotten to the commandments yet. Maybe these murders are the muse for the commandments. Maybe these murders are the Ten Commandments, what vaginas are to Georgia O'Keeffe. Wow. Georgia O'Keeffe! Georgia O'Keeffe, <laughs> who famously said, wait, you're saying my flowers look like what now? <laughs> Carry on. Vagina. All right, well... 
<laughs> we'll the start ten. unraveling the onion just a tad more here in the next verse when we come back. We're Genesis chapter 4, getting pretty close to the end here, verse 25 and verse 26. And we continue, verse 25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and she named him Seth. For God has given me other seed instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. It's interesting, you know, that we are, we're going back <laughs> after that little hiccup in Cain's line to Adam and Eve who are still very much alive, apparently. God provides the seed for Eve to have another kid, to essentially replace Abel. The timing is quite telling here. Apparently God isn't that okay with the little murdering issue after all. That seems uh, to plague the Cain ancestral line. Perhaps Seth is his insurance policy and will allow man to somehow amount to something. Well. Let's find out what this all means, and we'll get it right to our guests. Let's go to Dylan first. Dylan, what do you make uh, of this verse? First of all, I always find myself uncomfortable with the segments uh, about uh, the delivery of seed. That always just feels a little bit uh, 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 nauseating to me. And for the record, uh, I do correct people on the difference between nauseous and nauseate, uh, nauseated. Uh, my wife pointed out that that means I'm not only the jerk who collects your, corrects your grammar, but I'll do it when you're at your most vulnerable. Um, this, To me, this idea is really a pre-Darwinian understanding of genetics, that, uh, that, the, that the, the species itself is is filtering and mutating and changing the seed to develop towards something. Um, I think in this is the idea of an inherent morality in the, at that time, unknown DNA of the species. I think this is really about the evolution of conscience in man. And this is the next step in it. Okay, that, that whole line is problematic. Now there's a new line. That's what I think that verse is about. Mm. Hey, Jackie, do you think that, uh, like Dylan suggests possibly, that God maybe is, or maybe not God, but let's go with God since it's uh, this is the show. Is God manipulating the DNA? Is, he, doesn't, is the sauce not working? Or is he manipulating man's soul perhaps? Or is this just a numbers game, Jackie? You put out a lot of seed and you see what takes? Honestly, yeah, it sounds like God is playing some sneaky games and switching around some seed. Yeah, but you have to ask yourself, why? What is going on? Has he lost faith in Cain's line? Or is Maybe he just- Maybe he has. Uh, yeah. Maybe he has. He sees too much of this dark energy being, being cultivated by these humans that he has to put a little bit of his seed into their seed so he can up the consciousness of the low level vibing human seed <laughs> oh boy. i'm just gonna say seed as much as i can now yeah all right gabrielle i think that it's really also about life must go on we have to continue and it's um that we don't stop just where we're at so we have the opportunity to continue we to reflect and to be better and um, so I guess it is a little bit of upping the ante there. God is up by mixing his seed with, um, uh, you know, human seed and creating something better. But I think it is about evolution and it's about moving forward and it is about never giving up. Sandy, I, let's go to Sandy next. Not everything's going to work. Not everything's going to be good. Sometimes the things you write suck and sometimes they're gold. And eventually speak for yourself. Some, <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes sometimes there's a little bit of gold in something that sucks. You keep writing and writing, and there's a good component from a bad joke you can pair with something new that you wrote to become a good joke, a punchline that takes. God makes good people. It's the same process as writing a good joke. It's 
it's uh this is not an example of one of those but uh, humans are murdering at this point in existence is like what smoking was in the 80s we knew it was bad but we still let people do it in restaurants next to their kids <laughs> all right when we come back uh we'll go to i believe the very end of chapter four Ooh, Cain and Abel, finally over. And we continue with Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Here we go. And to Seth, also to him a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then it became common to call by the name of the Lord. Huh, Seth seems to emerge as the insurance for a more righteous offspring, and he appears to be off to a pretty good start, I guess. Bucking the trend of the day, Seth names his child not the name of God, but Enosh, which means in Hebrew, man or mortal. But why would this act of not naming your child after God somehow honor God? When we name someone, we project our hopes, our dreams onto that new life. We might name our child after a famous musician, someone we deeply admire, a comedian, an actor, a writer, an athlete, or a family relative we like. It is our hope that the, they embody the qualities of these special people. But in, in an era when there aren't you know, many people around yet, the name pickings could get a little slim. Perhaps at that time it was too tempting not to name your child after God, since God does extraordinary things, right? Everyone can't be named God. <laughs> after a while, God doesn't mean much. It's kind of like the word genius, you know, think about it, you know, he's a genius, she's a genius. Have you read him? He's a genius. Have you, have you seen his, have you seen her paintings? A genius. I actually have seen her paintings. I have no idea what, what I'm looking at. I told you she's a genius, <sighs> but everyone can't be a genius because that's completely antithetical to the meaning of the word. If everyone is a genius, then no one could be a genius. Well, maybe that's like with God. See, a real genius is a person that creates something as if nothing preceded it. A genius doesn't create the next logical step. A genius creates another stairway. And I know I'm digressing, but stay with me here because I'll get to the point. If you ever seen like a Frank Lloyd Wright house, anybody, anybody out there? You look around at the other houses built during the same period that surround it. It's like you look at this thing and you go, where did this come from? How, how, where? Take stand-up comedy, for instance. In the era of Bob Hope and Milton Berle rifling off punchlines, Lenny Bruce suddenly appears and decides that stand-up can be deeply personal, unfiltered rants, not relying on punchlines, but on humorous accounts of surviving an unjust world. Bob Hope to Lenny Bruce, there's no through line whatsoever. It's as if something was created from nothing. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Isn't that the Big Bang? I mean, don't we all, as kids, ask, well, what was before the Big Bang? What preceded it? Nothing. Wow. God is the ultimate genius, creator of the universe from seemingly nothing. Hey, we're made in his image, right? We just don't create in the magnitude of God. Eh, not even remotely close. So... If all the rage once upon a time was having your name be God, as this verse suggests, or perhaps think of yourself as God, which happens to be a, a new age trend today as well, then like with the actual genius of today, the, the real God has been cheapened, defamed, and ultimately rendered meaningless. We are left hopelessly crippled, unable to be grateful for any of it. When Seth names his child Enosh, man mortal, he announces to the world the awe and wonder of the real God, perhaps helping his fellow man to see clearly again God's glorious creations. Well, there you go, huh? Gabrielle, what do you think Seth is up to here, bucking the trend and not naming his kid God? 
I, I think that there is still something that is each individual and as God is separate from us and together with us, we are also together with God and separate. Sandy, you have named both your children God. How is that working out for you? <laughs> Not so good, Scott. Not so good. <laughs> you want to know why? You carry the name why of God. That, you better. You got to be able to back it up. My kids have not <laughs> been able to potty train themselves like I was hoping. When like, if you're named after somebody great, you you never have a ch you never really have a, Frank Sinatra Jr. never really had a chance. I I just think that Steve Jobs named the place in his store's genius bar and then God struck him down for it because those people aren't geniuses. The genius doesn't fix the design of the stairs, but they invent the escalator to avoid all that pesky exercise. Could you read me the lines of the verse one more time so that I can parse this out? Uh, Craig, could you bring Someone it up, please? And to send also <laughs> to him, a son was born, and he named him Enosh. First of all, Enosh, uh, very early internet access to snacks. Uh, this renaming idea that at the time that everyone named him after God, I think this is exactly the thing. I think this is man starting to realize, oh, the power is in us. We no longer have to be drawing our sense of self from who our uh, deity is. Jackie, you have a comment on this? It can be interpreted in a, an infinite amount of ways. And that's why we are where we are in life. There's an also- What did you read there's like, there? There's like that a we didn't billion get... Jesuses. And I think Mohammed is like the number one name in the world. So we do still do that. Seth was the first one to realize that his kid will be beaten up in grade school if he is named God. <laughs> Gabrielle, do you have any, uh, do you have any final thought on, on this? I think it's aspirational. I think that we have to never settle for where we're at and always uh, try to go and reach beyond. Beautiful. That's a great way to end it. All right. I hope you learned something because I, God only knows what I've learned. <laughs>